Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. My co-host, Dr. Matt Woolley, he's a clinical psychologist. True. Yeah. Still. For those who don't know and just joining, what is a clinical psychologist? Um, It's a psychologist who has a doctoral degree who works in the clinical field. So like usually treating patients for some psychological issue, maybe also doing research and things. And you do not specialize in addiction. No, addiction is not a specialty that I chose. I think I've mentioned before that the addiction people all seemed a little too intense for me when Mm -hmm. I was going to grad school. Uh, I now get why. <laughs> but um, After five years of doing this yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, it, but uh, I specialize in anxiety disorders and treatment thereof. And consequently, I have a lot of patients who use and abuse and maybe at times uh, are addicted to substances because of self-medicating, right? Anxiety is extremely miserable state to be in. It makes you feel very uncomfortable. It's very physical. Mm -hmm. And so when you drink alcohol, smoke weed, take other drugs, oftentimes that is a quick fix, but not a good long-term fix for a person's anxiety. So we've had people on the show plenty of times say like, oh man, the first time I had a drink, I was like, oh, this is how everyone feels. Yeah, this is how they feel. So as a psychologist, I think anybody who, who works in mental health also has to know quite a bit about substance abuse. Oftentimes when to refer, Mm -hmm. you know, if if a person's primary issue is alcohol or drugs. But you know, the thing is, is that we found on this podcast, most people's primary thing isn't the drugs and alcohol. Once you start peeling the layers back or unpacking the backpack, uh, a lot of times it is self-medicating that have led them to into the addiction. But, you know, there's, I mean, there's usually a backstory. Well, uh, definitely. Um, Interestingly enough, this week I had a former patient contact me and want to come back to do therapy. And that was sort of their route was they struggled with anxiety, but self-medicated with drugs and alcohol, uh, got into some legal trouble uh, because of the drugs and alcohol. Which tends to happen. Tends to happen. Spent some jail time, spent some uh, um, recovery time, you know, uh, IOP, and now they're ready to kind of get back to working on the anxiety because they have gotten sober and they have some good support in that arena. And now we're working on, you know, trying to support him in that as well, but primarily back working on anxiety. So, yeah, you know, I, it may not be a specialty, but I think if you talk to any therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist out there, we all spend quite a bit of time talking to people about uh, substance abuse. Yeah, That's why they call it recovery, not recovered, because right. it is a journey. And it's a, uh, li- it's, it's a change of your lifestyle. Yeah. Right. And when we started this uh, podcast, uh, we started it for a couple of reasons. And one was to share stories of others who are battling addiction. So maybe loved ones or uh, friends of theirs might know what to do or, or, or how to react and show you that recovery is possible. The other reason was to share my journey, uh, my personal journey, because here I am five years sober mm-hmm. of the things that I go through while I'm journeying uh, into recovery. Yeah. And I had one just the other night. When's your five-year day? Uh, it was September 3rd. September 3rd. Yep. Yeah, I remember. I knew it was September. I, I didn't miss it, Josh. Josh is laughing through his nose at me over there. No, yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. it's Labor Day, and but it was my five years. We should have done, uh, like, why don't we do a big thing? We, we did do some things. My kids wrote me some letters. They gave me yeah. a banana cream pie, which but is like, my KSL favorite. KSL should have, like, thrown a lunch and a big party with lots of balloons and well, stuff. Well, KSL rehired me and gave me my career back. Oh, right. so I guess I'm, that's, I think I'm, uh, that's fair. I think they're pretty that was good. Their, yeah, that was I, their party? I, I still owe them. All right, okay. Um, but well, I'm taking you out to dinner then. Man. Okay. Okay. I would love it. And the, the lovely, lo- Leslie. lovely Leslie. Yep. So uh, Frankie, my middle child, probably most like me, yeah. uh, is getting ready to turn 16. Mm. Uh, so she's been in driver's ed. Uh, she's been taking the classes. She's got a permit. She's been asking me to drive. Did they watch that video, Leadfoot? No, Leadfoot or Did, Murder on the Highway. Murder, you remember those? Those yeah. were awesome. But we did have to go to this uh this kind of assembly and it was part of her driver's ed education and we go there and it's brought to you by uh, the state of Utah called zero fatalities and they do this big presentation of distracted driving and all these other things and as I'm driving there with Frankie in my head I know there's going to be a big segment on drinking and driving yeah if many of you who don't know but maybe some of you do um I got in a bad accident, a DUI. I was selfless. I was a jerk. And, Selfish. Yep. And um, caused an accident and could have killed people. 
Right. And by the grace of God, nobody was seriously injured. I hate that term seriously injured because I think any injury is serious. Yeah. And uh, still this day, I haven't talked to the family and it's, it's, it's on one of my things to do. And I just haven't made it happen yet. Well, my understanding was in the beginning, they weren't quite ready to no. have a conversation with you. And so I still hope one day that I'll be able to sit them down and show them all the things that I'm doing because of that. And what a catalyst that was for me to change my life and become a better person, a better dad, a better friend, a better civilian, a better person. I hope so, too, because, you know, I worry for them, obviously, that, um, you know, there's can be PTSD from an accident. There can be resentment. You know, there can be hard feelings things. And, and, and deserved. But five years later, one of the things that could be under their control would be to try to find some resolution with you. So, I mean, I, I just from a psychologist's point of view, the more we can let go and forgive in life, the healthier we are. So. Forgiveness is a gift, and it's a gift yeah. that I can't make them give me. No, no, no. And and, 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 and they, don't, they, I, don't, they, don't deserve, they don't owe me a forgiveness? No. No. Yeah, I don't mean it that way. It's just I think, uh, you know, I hope they're doing well, I guess, basically is the way I would say that. But I'm driving there with my daughter, and I know there's going to be a big segment mm -hmm. on drinking and driving, drugs and driving, and all of that. And... Uh, I'm, I'm driving there with her, you know, and I'm talking to her. And I go, you know, there's going to be a big segment on this. She goes, you okay, Dad? And I go, yeah. And, and I try to be tough and, and act like, you know, it didn't bother me. But it bothered me. You know what I mean? Because there I am sitting with my daughter and all of her friends mm -hmm. and her school and their parents and thinking to myself, they're going to do this big segment on drinking and driving. And here I'm a convicted DUI. Mm -hmm. And they're all going to be looking back or talking about it's me. It's not like they don't know who you are. <laughs> uh, many of them do. And, and right. I think well, they, most people, they know the work I'm doing. Yeah. And hopefully my work speaks for me. Yeah. Um, but it was. It was embarrassing. You know what I mean? And sure. once again, it was one of those times that my past has, you know, kicked me in the, to remind me that, you know, mm -hmm. do not go back there, you know? And Frankie, to her credit, is amazing. You know, mm -hmm. she was smiling. And I go, You sure you want me to go? Because, you know, your mom could go. She says, No, Dad, you're cool. I want you to go. Okay. You know, so she, it wasn't bothering That's her, great. Or her at all. Yeah. You know, and so I was just like, okay. And we stayed there and the presentation was amazing. And mm -hmm. all the kids, you know, signed this contract that they won't drink and drive and all this. Did other. they ever call you up on stage and make you sign it? No, no. no. Okay. But I did, I did bring the contract home and I was telling my girlfriend about it. And I said, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, they didn't do that when we were kids. No. There wasn't any of that. Well, I mean, now you got to graduate to let friends in the car and mm -hmm. all these other things. And, you know, they, they really want want them to drive before they get 16 with a parent to learn the rules of the road and all that stuff. And it it's reminded much me better. what a privileged driving is because I went a year and a half without a driver's license mm -hmm. and it was miserable. Yeah. I took my daughter's bike to the Smiths to get milk. Right. I had to walk to my kid's school for presentations and I was over two miles away, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it was a constant <laughs> reminder as you see people driving past you. And yeah. you, you it's not fun. <laughs> say when you're 12, you're kind of used to that, but yeah. not at our ages. No. It's, it and, is hard. And so yeah. that was, so that was cool, you know, and, and I'm proud of my daughter and uh, I'm grateful that she believes in her old man and, uh, is not ashamed to be seen with me because that could have been an uncomfortable situation for everybody involved. And sure. she was she was proud of her dad. It's like, nope, I want you there. Well, you know, one thing you did really well on the parenting scale there is you talked to her about it ahead of time. You asked her how she felt about it. Um, she asked you if you felt comfortable to go. You guys had a nice conversation before you got in there. And that's key, you know, dialoguing, talking about getting stuff out in the air open and talking things out in a family. A lot of families don't do that. And they would have just gone in and everybody would have been silently uncomfortable. So good job. That and was, I'm, that I'm was very the blessed. right way I'm, to do it. I'm very blessed. Uh, and then the next thing I got for you is uh, a Christian Bale quote. You know who Christian Bale is? Batman. He's the Batman. Yeah. Um, and we were talking off air because sometimes on Facebook we have people who – Sing our praises. Right. And other times you have people who think we're complete idiots. A couple of them. Yeah. And, 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 and that's what it is. And so we started talking back and forth and, and uh, you know, what about hate mail and, and how do you deal with it? And Did you talk about that proposal you had for Facebook comments? 
What was that? The one where you have to blow into the thing before you can leave your comment oh, yeah. to make sure you're not drunk. I think drunk. that'd be a great one yeah. because you think drunk, drunk dialing is bad, drunk Facebook and yeah. it's worse. You know so what I mean? I, I feel like the negative comments would cut way down if they I've had I've got to, a couple friends yeah. who I'll read their Facebook comment and I'll call them and be like, had to hey, blow clean bro, before they can whoa, leave a Facebook. Yeah. Oh, you got to retract <laughs> that now. That is not a good look for you. You know what I mean? Was that aggressive? Right. Yeah, that was yeah. aggressive. Yeah. You got to you got to pump the brakes on that. That idea one. is trademarked, by the way. We got to yeah. we're working on it. With, you know. But so what I was thinking is, is that I heard this quote from Christian Bell, and it says, if you have a problem with me, text me. If you don't have my number, then you don't know me well enough to have a problem with me. <laughs> I like it. And that kind of, I thought of that quote because you told me, you said, you know, I don't think anybody who truly knows me right. would think that I'm a jerk. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would agree. But so many people will see something online or hear something yeah. and then automatically jump on the bandwagon. But if you don't have my number... You don't know me well enough. Well, you're a public figure, you know, you're not quite the Batman level, but everybody knows who you are in the state of Utah. And more importantly, you're putting all your stuff out there. Like this show, you could have chosen not to do this show, right? You could have chosen to do something else. And and instead, you're putting all your stuff out there. And I'm impressed that most people appreciate that and hold it gently in their hands but uh there are some people that like to tear others down and i think that's probably what christian bale's used to dealing with i wasn't going to read this but i well i'm going to okay uh, i was it was kind of on the fence of it all right so i had a cool thing happen to me at this club i'm a member of uh they nominated me for the board of directors and oh, nice. i had to come up with this bio okay and so yesterday I, I got the call. It says, hey, you've been nominated. Congratulations. Would you write a bio? And this, we're going to send it out to the members, and then they're going to vote and see if you make the board of directors. Well, do I make it? I don't know, because it's not in my hands at this to point. To be continued. To be continued. All right. So I was writing my bio, and there's a section in here that uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to put in or not, but then I was like, screw it. I'm going to put it in. Okay. And so here it is. Many of you know this, but some of you may not. I'm an alcoholic in recovery, and I've been sober now for more than five years. I attribute much of my sobriety to the country club. You might be asking yourself why I'm telling you this. The reason is that I want you to know the real me and that it is part of who I am. When I first started getting sober, I was worried I wouldn't be accepted or welcomed at the club. Maybe the guys I partied with didn't want the pressure of me being around. Maybe some of you who've seen me in my glory days weren't too impressed with me. But the club welcomed me with warm arms and an open embrace and offered me nothing but support in my sobriety journey. You all treated me like family and I'll forever be grateful. And so that's well said. The that's reason well I put said. that in there is because that's one of the things that I try to do in my recovery and my sobriety. I'll get it out of my mouth first before you even have to ask. Yeah. Because that keeps me sober. That keeps me on a level playing ground with everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we've had uh, Lizzie Dankers on the show. And, uh, you know, her thing was, if you're going to know me, you're going to know all of me, just not the parts I want you to know. Right. And I think that's how I really try to live my recovery. It's like, if you're going to know me, you're going to know my whole story. Yeah. And hopefully through knowing my whole story, you'll know what I'm about and where I'm going and what I stand for. Well, getting out ahead of it like that, it lets you have the freedom to, to just burst the bubble if there's any tension in the room. And um, I think somebody who is reading that will, if, if they, either they have a prejudice against alcoholism and, and they would never vote for you anyway, but most people, I think, will be appreciative and impressed that you just put it right out there. Because I had some people say, yeah. do you think you need that? I think most people know. And I go, I, I do. I do. Yeah. I think I need to because it is a part of me and it's what I stand for. Well, and you want a board member who's somebody who's honest. <laughs> yeah. Right. And 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 can own, own their truth. And uh, that means, you know, that's a good indication you'd do that on their board. So that's yeah. so. So why am cool. I telling you guys this stuff? Because this is part of my recovery journey. This is stuff that even five years after getting sober that I still deal with, that I still acknowledge, that I still own, so and that I still move forward with. Sometimes we talk about like treatment modalities that are very formal, like a 12-step program or things like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm always interested in what our guests are doing just sort of on the daily, like the things that they do that keep them on the right track. Routine maintenance. Yeah. And I think that's one of yours is you just tell it there's not know. a day goes by that i don't tell somebody that i'm a recovering alcoholic yeah. or that i do a podcast about sobriety yeah. and that i mean every day i talk about it yeah and, and usually it's probably the best part of my day 
And I do a lot of cool stuff, but to see the light in people's eye or to see somebody go, oh, I can talk to you, yeah. it, it really keeps me going forward and it really gives me gas. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, not like bad gas. Well, that too, maybe. I don't know. I know it doesn't. Okay. I'll ask Leslie. Our guest today is named Russ. He's been sober for four years. He said his DOC was alcohol. You actually called uh, alcohol your mistress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have a love affair with it? I think I did. Yeah. And it ended badly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was toxic for sure. Russ, what's your last name? Sweeten. We're going to find out more about Russ Sweeten. You're listening to Project Recovery. Stick around. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. My name is Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolier. Our guest today is Russ Sweeten. Uh, been sober a little over four years. Uh, Dr. Matt asked me my sobriety date. What's yours? July 3rd, 2019. Ooh, you went before the 4th of July. Yes, sir. Most addicts. <laughs> July 5th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when you're ready, you're ready. Yes, sir. And so we're going to find out what got you to that ready point. But where does the story of Russ Wheaton begin? I, I grew up uh, in parts of Davis County and Weber County as well. Um, I think, you know, I'd best say I grew up a little bit poor. Um, you know, my parents both worked. We were latchkey kids growing up. I'm the oldest of uh, four. And, uh, you know, both of my parents worked a lot and uh, just trying to provide for us. And uh, so did that put a lot of responsibility on you as an older brother? Were you kind of the, the makeshift caretaker? Yeah, I think at times, yeah, I was expected to kind of be the, the one who made sure the house didn't burn down. And What do you call that, Dr. Matt? Parentified? Yep, parentified. And so you were just making sure the house didn't burn down, but it also gave you a little bit of power. Absolutely. And so... Uh, Three younger siblings. Uh, you're the oldest. Um, your parents still married? Yes, they are. Uh, and um, what led you to um, maybe your first drink or your first substance, whatever it may be? So I think what led me to my first drink was just, you know, almost the, the cliche about addicts, about not feeling like you belong, not feeling like you're really part of anything and wanting to be accepted and then uh, feeling that anxiety of not feeling like you really fit in anywhere. And, you know, it, uh, it, it's interesting because we hear that, that sentiment a lot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but the other one is just curiosity. You know, I want to know what the hubbub's all about. I want to know what the movies are showing me. I want to know what the older kids are doing. Uh, and I feel like I fall in that camp, but the longer I've done this podcast, I think I had some insecurities and, you know, I mean, that's a normal part of childhood adolescent is feeling insecure, wanting to be part of the group. But I think also what you're saying, Russ, is that, you know, it's a type of you're kind of describing and you can correct me if you don't agree with this, but uh, a type of social anxiety, feeling right. kind of awkward different i think casey overcame a lot of his with being the class clown right mm -hmm. like and and a lot of what a lot of people don't know is you go to an elementary school find the bully and find the class clown and they're actually both probably compensating for feeling awkward or anxious socially 100 percent, yeah so you wanted to fit in a little social anxiety and you know for a lot of people um Alcohol and drugs at that young age is a social currency. It gives you some status and some credit. You yeah, know what I mean? Like a cool bad boy. Yeah. yeah. And so how old were you when you had your first drink? I was 14. And uh, was it a party setting? Did you guys steal from somebody? So it was actually up camping in the UNS with a bunch of family. And I had an older cousin that just offered me a beer one night when my dad had gone to bed early. And, um, you know, but I, I remember distinctly connecting with that pretty quickly of like wow this is this is this feels great this is relief that instant you know relief from the anxiety and the, you didn't do what most 14 year olds go this tastes horrible why do you guys drink this stuff no no absolutely not i i loved it i loved that i was being included with my older uh cousins and uh you know allowed to kind of have this uh place that i felt like maybe i didn't belong and um you know, and then, like I said, I just remember feeling that instant, instant relief of like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is great. That affiliation need is a big one, too, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're that age, middle school, you know, early high school, you want to be a grown up. You want to be, you know, that's the biggest pain in the neck about like early adolescence from like 12 to 14 is they think they're all grown up. But of course, they have no grown up skills. So 
when older kids or people that you value that are older than you include you in something, oh man, it feels like a million bucks. Well, right. that's a weird age, that ninth grade year, you know, the eighth and ninth, right. that tween is because you feel too old for the sixth graders, but you're definitely too young for the 12th graders. Right, right. You, you know look what at I mean? the seniors so, and they look like, you know, they're 30. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. So it's an hard time, but you found somebody who wanted you in the circle. You got to sit at the big table and off off and running i guess yeah i loved it and uh you know what was your family culture around drinking honestly um both of my parents didn't really drink when i was growing up you know they both they worked a lot um occasionally they would uh, be at a barbecue or something and you know have a couple drinks um but i never watched my parents really struggle with the addiction so i always kind of felt like that that was a little bit of a different you know story from my perspective as far as you know i didn't grow up witnessing a whole lot of it um but so it wasn't completely taboo but it just wasn't something that your your parents did correct yeah do you know if addiction runs in your family it absolutely does i have you know uncles and cousins and grandparents that have all struggled with addiction and still to to this day so. and how did you guys deal with that as a family was it something that it was talked about or was it one of those things where you know uncle larry's got his problems i think for me it was more like that it was more you know well you know why is uncle so-and-so not there you know what i mean and it's like well uncle so-and-so is an alcoholic and you know it's just kind of we didn't didn't really address it didn't really talk about you know what that meant or anything but there was like some shame a little bit that went around it they were maybe looked at as less than you know in our family uh, hierarchy or whatever there was definitely kind of a hush topic yeah, right yeah, yeah. so after your first beer at 14 up in the mountains uh how often did you consume alcohol I didn't have alcohol again probably for about another year, mainly because I just didn't really have access to it. My parents never kept it in the house. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends who did it or anything, but I remember thinking that I wanted to do it again, that if I had the opportunity to do it again, I was definitely going to do it. So that one beer kind of planted a seed in your mind right. where you were, you were kind right. of like thinking about it and uh, looking, maybe waiting for another opportunity. Right. And I, and I had more than one beer that night. I got yeah. pretty, pretty, oh, did you? pretty okay. drunk from, from what I remember. And I felt pretty sick the next day and that still didn't even yeah. deter me from being like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this again. Isn't that so. interesting, Casey? Like, you know, that, that is one of the hallmarks of addiction or at least dependency is that when a, when you don't have the substance, you're kind of thinking about when's the next time I can drink or smoke. But for you, it was just one night and then it kind of lasted a lot longer, you know, like a year, you're still thinking about it. Right. Absolutely. So then when did uh, drinking become kind of a all the time thing or just uh, how did, how did you kind of ease your way into that? I think when I, when I hit high school, when I was a, you know, a junior in high school or sophomore rather, um, you know, I had friends that were like, hey, let's left school. Let's, you know, and I had never left school. I'd never left school. I was like, okay, cool. That sounds awesome. Are we going to get in trouble? And they're like, no, you just walk out and leave. Like, it's that simple. And I was like, all right. And we went over to their house and that's the first thing that they did. It was, you know, pulled out some beers out of their dad's fridge and it's like, here, Russ, have one. And, you know, so, and I thought it was great. Um, you know, and, and I, again, had that feeling of maybe being accepted by kids that I viewed as being, you know, maybe a little bit cooler than I was, maybe having a little bit more than I had. And, you know, it gave me that feeling of belonging pretty quickly. So um, did it ever lead to trouble at an early age? Oh, absolutely. For me, I, I, th I think it's funny because, uh, you know, for a lot of people, alcohol and addiction in general is, is very progressive. But I knew pretty early on that alcohol is a problem for me and mainly because people told me alcohol was a problem for me. You know, I had, I had friends that drank pretty regularly on the weekends and stuff like that. And I would go and drink with them and they'd be like, you know, Russ, the next day you really shouldn't drink. Like that's, it's not for you, buddy. Like it's just not. Was it because you got aggressive? Did you get sloppy? It was sloppy. It was usually sloppy and usually doing things that were way outside of my character. You know, those are always we're always what I was notorious. Let's go for. streaking. Right. Let's let's do that. Let's let's hit on your best friend's girlfriend. Let's oh. you know what I mean? Do things that are definitely way outside your normal yeah. character, things that get you in trouble in relationships with your friends and you know, and, and those friends saying, Hey, you know, 
you kind of ruined the good time. You're like, let's, let's, you know, and at the time I just felt like they were being hypocrites and didn't want me to have fun. You know? I know exactly but, what you're saying, but uh, it, because uh, I was that guy. You know? It's funny how that needle can go from one extreme to the other, where without alcohol, the social anxiety would make, make it so you'd never do those things mm-hmm. and you'd be very self-conscious and then you get enough alcohol on board and like the needle swings to the other end where you're like, yeah. I'm definitely going to, you know, go way beyond my character. And know? I think that's always been the problem for me is that, uh, and I didn't really learn that till I finally went to rehab when I'm 35, but you know, that when I would get a taste of alcohol there, I do recall feeling like a switch was flipped. And every time that switch flips, it's like, I can't shut it off. And See, it's like, I went into so many situations where, you know, I, I, I told you earlier, I called alcohol my mistress, you know, mm-hmm. I loved alcohol. I loved that feeling. I loved, um, you know, how it gave me that relief and I wanted to master it so badly. I wanted to be like my friends and people that I knew that seemed to be able to do it without any consequences. And, and so I was like, there's gotta be something I'm missing. There's gotta be some trick to this that I've got to just figure out and I'll be able to do it. You were always overshooting your window, right? That's what my friends would tell me. Right. You overshot your window, Casey. (laughs) That means because you didn't know when to stop because what you're describing is the same thing that I had. I didn't have an off button. Once I, once I got one that we were off to the races, let's, let's see where we're going to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not going to quit, you know, last man standing wins. (laughs) Well, and I would wake up from the blackout pretty frequently and you know, the, the normal things that we deal with when we've gotten blackout drunk and have friends or family that are upset with you, sometimes angry, sometimes they don't want to talk to you anymore. Uh, because of your actions while you were blackout drunk. And, you know, I always remember people just being always so confused. They're like, why did you not stop? Why couldn't you just, you know, get that buzz going and then stop? And it's like, I remember always feeling frustrated because it's like, I wanted to, I wanted to do it. And I told myself going into it, hey, I'm going to do it right this time. I'm going to, I'm going to have just a few drinks and nothing bad is going to happen. I'm not going to embarrass myself. And it just never worked out. It always, always turned into the blackout sloppy drunk and some of my drunkest nights were the nights i told myself i'm not going to drink at all yeah i mean it's crazy you go to a party and go i'm not going to drink at all it's like being oppositional with yourself yeah right like part one one mind says i'm not going to drink at all the other mind says oh yeah <laughs> watch yeah and so you're, you're starting to ruin friendships uh family members are saying stuff um Were you ever in high school, like involved in extracurriculars or things like that? I was for, at the beginning of high school, I was involved in in wrestling and basketball. But, uh, you know, once once I discovered girls and and partying, that became like my obsession. That became like all of that other stuff went to the wayside. School didn't really matter. I only went to school as a social avenue to meet up with these friends and let's find the party. So how fun are the phone calls uh, the morning after a blackout? Um, Those to me are something that I always feared like worse than anything. And a lot of times I would even not uh, pick up my cell phone for several hours because I knew that there was going to be texts or phone calls on there that I did not want to deal with because it was always uh, a very painful feeling of a feeling of, uh, you know, guilt and remorse and Oh, so, some yeah. of the worst. Did it yeah. cost you any friendships at that age? Yeah, absolutely. I do distinctly remember, you know, especially one friend of mine, um, when I was, uh, about 19, I tried to, uh, hop into bed with his wife when we were all drinking one night and that, you know, pretty much ended the relationship. <laughs> that as cooled far the friendship as I, off, I don't, huh? I don't remember us hanging out. I don't remember him ever telling me that we weren't friends, but I do remember that. I don't think we ever hung out after that. Yeah. I don't, I don't blame him. So, so you graduate high school, do you? Yeah. I, I barely graduated high school. Yes. And, um, uh, At any point, is your family talking to you about your drinking? And what are they saying? Absolutely. I think even from that first time uh, that I got drunk and got sick, you know, when I was 14, I remember my mom talking to me and, you know, alcoholism runs in our family. And this is something that can be really dangerous if you don't, you know, have control over it. You probably shouldn't, you know, substances are dangerous and, you know, talking to me about it then. And then, you know, I got into trouble a few times in school with not coming home. Um, because I was drunk and passed out somewhere. And, you know, uh, one time I got brought home by police officers and got an alcohol ticket. And, you know, so definitely there was some some talks and some discipline. Um, you know, they found alcohol in my room a few times. And, you know, there was definitely some concern there. So after high school, where does uh, young Russ go? 
So I always kind of had this pattern of I would clean up for a while and then self-sabotage. Um, you know, I cleaned up for a little while. I'm doing well. I graduate high school. Um, and then I start kind of going off the rails again with the drinking. And then um, I get a DUI at 20 and I wrecked my truck. I fell asleep at the wheel, uh, ran into a parked vehicle. Thank God no one was there, but, uh, you know, totaled my truck, went, went and spent the night in jail. So I remember thinking that it was kind of messed up that I'm like, I'm not even 21 yet and I'm already getting my first DUI, you mm -hmm. know, so. So after that, they got to put you on some sort of classes and, and do some things. Oh, absolutely. Had the lots of fines. I had to take classes. I did some community service, lost my license for a year. I know that you mentioned that earlier and that, yep. that was not a fun time for sure. And I remember the high insurance rates. I couldn't even afford to have a car anymore. I had to, I remember having to sell my car because I couldn't afford the insurance. On they call it, it SR-22, yeah. high yes. risk insurance. It's yeah. nasty. So, um, but yeah, you know, that kind of steered me in, in a, in a different direction at the time. I, like I said, I've always kind of been on that roller coaster. I was like, okay, well I need to clean up. Clearly something's not going right. So I quit drinking for a little while, and, but I chased a different addiction and that was work for me. Um, I was uh, working at a restaurant at the time and I had a manager was kind of, bragging about how much he got on his bonus one day and I was blown away how much money he was making. And so I kind of started shooting for that and had that goal, that uh, carrot, if you will, in front of me. And mm -hmm. I started chasing that career. And, you know, within about a year and a half, I was running my own restaurant and, uh, you know, seeming to do pretty well, but, uh, you know, never really addressed the problem, never really addressed the, the thinking issues that I had. And so eventually the alcohol came back and the wanting to be accepted and, um, you know, it started to creep back in and affect my job. So, um, you know, I was, uh, married at the time and we had our two boys and, uh, you know, I, I, alcohol ruined that marriage. I mean, it was, you know, both of us were drinking. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot of bit about doing things outside of my character. Um, you know, and that's, that's what alcohol did. We, uh, we both did things that were way outside of our character and it ruined our trust with each other and marriage fell apart as a result. So um, by the time I'm 25, I'm divorced and two kids. So. And a lot of it to blame is alcohol. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you're divorced in 25. Uh, you still got the job running the, the restaurant? No. It, it, by then, I, I had, had left that and in, in a last-ditch effort to try and save the first marriage. I thought that maybe me working, you know, 80-hour work weeks was somehow, you know, making it so it wasn't possible and that that's why my marriage was falling apart because it couldn't be the alcohol, right? right. So it couldn't, couldn't be that. It couldn't be us cheating on each other or doing things that were just awful. Um, so, you know, I quit that left the restaurant business, tried to get a more stable nine to five job. And that's when I was able to start working for the federal government. Um, you know, my mom helped me get a job. And so went to kind of the nine to five thinking that that's going to work. And then all that happened was the drinking increased, you know, with well, the, yeah, more with time the working less, I've got more time <laughs> to drink. The drinking increased, yeah. the partying increased and the marriage fell apart anyway. So um, at know. any point now you're in your mid twenties, a divorce with a couple of kids mm -hmm. was rehab or any kind of help on the table. Did anyone mention anything? Um, I'd had a couple friends that, uh, had seen me drink that had suggested it. I'd had family members ask me if they felt like I needed help. Um, you know, but not, not really any serious, like, Hey, you need to go to rehab type of discussions yet. Um, like I said, I always seem to kind of swing it back the other way. You know what I mean? I would find a way to kind of keep it under keep it under control or at least hide it well enough, you know, that it didn't seem like it was much of a problem um, until it finally spilled over. Um, you know, when I was out of my marriage, I was out dating and trying to enjoy that life, going to the bar a lot. Um, and that's when, uh, you know, I started uh, driving drunk, blackout drunk and coming home. And uh, my sister was living with me at the time. And I remember she just was like, I can't believe you drove home last night. Like, uh, you know, because she knew that I had blacked out. Um, she had seen me stumble in the door, you know, blackout drunk. And that was it was about that time that her and the rest of my family sat me down and had an intervention at the time and said, you know, we're really worried about you. We're worried you're going to die. We're worried you're going to kill someone. You know what I mean? It's just this is out of control. 
And, uh, you know, at the time I was like, you guys are right. I need to, I need to quit this. I need to quit it. And they're like, well, go to rehab, you know? And at the time I was like, no, I don't need rehab. I don't want to do that. I think in, in retrospect now, I really didn't want to quit drinking is what it comes down to. And to me, rehab was like waving the white flag and mm-hmm. giving up. Well, I think what you were doing is what I tried to do for 15 plus years. Mm-hmm. You seem like a smart, intelligent man. Uh, you've talked about your drinking in the past that you just haven't figured out that one crucial part of it. Why can't I stop or why right. can't I do this? So at this game, you're still negotiating with your sobriety. Right. You're trying to figure out the missing key. And so you've got all this information and you're an information man guy, uh, Matt. Um, you know, I'm just missing something. And what is it? And right. if I can just do that, everything's going to be good. Which and is I, kind of a sophisticated way of justifying continuing oh, it's to drink. It's 100% right? justifying. Right. Right. Absolutely. But, yeah. but it's kind of sophisticated because you're like, oh, I'm a smart guy. I can just... That one thing, I just, I can figure it out and then I can drink like a gentleman, like everybody else. And I don't have to give it up. And and I think the other part of your brain is saying, no, you can't, but you push that away oh, yeah. to, to be like, no, 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 I, I'll figure it out. I can, I can do this. So your parents uh, do an intervention, mm-hmm. your sister, you decline treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what are your... What, what are your thoughts on going forward? I think I think the agreement at the time was okay. If you think you can quit, that's great. But if you don't, you agree that you know soon you're going to go to go to rehab. So so you bought you some time. So I bought myself some time, and all I did was immediately just switch to a new drug of choice, and that was weed at the time. You know what I mean? I was on I was on the marijuana maintenance program, and I started smoking weed every day. Um, and that did give me some relief. It gave me that. And you relief. did that on purpose so you could stop drinking. Absolutely. And I had already, you know, played around with marijuana a little bit over the years, but it just never was the one that I was really into. But at that time, it became that. It became like, okay, this out is, of necessity. This is how I'm going to have the relief. This is how I'm going to, you know. And I didn't seem to experience any consequences with it immediately. So you know, it just seemed like the perfect solution. I'm not drinking, you know. So those problems have gone away. Um, you know, I'm smoking marijuana every day and it, and it did pretty quickly start increasing to where I'm doing it before I go to work. I'm leaving on my lunch break to do it again. I'm, you know, doing it right when I get off work and doing it all night long and then smoking more and more and more and more. But that's the lie about alcohol Mm -hmm. and drugs is they work until they don't. Right. And, uh, I mean, they do work. I'm not going to lie to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, at first you're like, this is is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're drinking less. You're, you're fine. But then you need more. It lasted all of about nine months for me, you know, and, and and at the time I was really proud of it. I was like, this is the longest I've gone without drinking since I was a kid. And, you know, this is working. So clearly, why would I need to change any of this? And then, you know, it worked until it didn't, just like you said. Now, I seem to recall you were working for the federal government. Mm-hmm. But you're also smoking weed. Mm -hmm. Were you worried about that drug testing or anything? Was that absolutely? Yeah, it was a constant fear. It was a constant, you know, that this is that that was the downside of that particular thing was that this is gonna, you know, this is gonna come back at some point. You know, they could at any point test me. I mean, if you're going to smoke at lunch, chances are. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So, yeah, and and. I honestly can't chalk it up to anything but luck that it never happened, you know, but, uh, yeah. So you said it lasted about nine months and mm -hmm. did that come to a crashing halt or, I mean, how, or how does it, how do we get you to your rock bottom? Are we close? No, no, the, the (laughs) rock bottom didn't come until I was 35. I mean, to me, um, you know, at that time, uh, around that time is when I met my current wife and, uh, you know, I told her right from the beginning, hey, I have a problem with alcohol. You know, everyone so around you were, me. you were owning it. You yeah. Hadn't, you hadn't really gone to rehab. To, to but, that extent, yeah. you know, I mean, I knew that I had only had a couple months sober from alcohol when I met her. And I told her, hey, I smoke weed every day. And that's just who I am. You know, if you and she was OK with that, you know, she, all of her friends were doing that. And she was totally OK with that. She didn't really fully understand why the drinking was such a bad thing. Um, but you know, all of my family would tell her, Hey, this is Russ. We love him. Just don't let him drink. You know what I mean? And so she didn't understand why she hadn't been there for all the previous events. And, um, you know, by the time we're about together for, uh, six or seven months, um, you know, she had a friend come in from out of town and they of course decided they were going to have a few drinks and, you know, they're like, 
they let their guard down because they were drinking. And so I started drinking with them. And of course, you know, nothing bad happened to, to the extent that it had in the past. You know, I didn't get fall down drunk. I didn't try to sleep with anyone that I shouldn't sleep <laughs> with. And so, you know, in their eyes, it's like, hey, we don't get why you're not allowed to drink. You were fine, you know. And so to me, that was like, bam, I have a license now. I can do Maybe I'm fixed. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm cured. Maybe I grew up. Maybe I matured, and it's just different now. You know what I mean? And so I started drinking regularly. And, uh, you know, I think my family pretty immediately knew that it was going to become a problem from their experiences with me, but I didn't listen. And, you know, uh, and, I, and like I said, I liked it. I loved drinking. So. And so that didn't last long, huh? No, no. It's pretty quickly went downhill, you know, even just a few years into my marriage, uh, losing the house that I was living in, um, you know, almost lost my job a couple times, um, got really close to losing my job. Um, and finally, you know, just slowly deteriorating, drinking more and more to the point where my health started turning really bad. I'm going to stop you real quick because how does one lose a house to drinking? Because you're spending that much money on alcohol? Absolutely. And just just not minding your responsibilities. You We've had I mean? people uh, on the podcast who said they've spent, you know, eight to twelve hundred dollars a day yeah. in, in uh, pharmaceuticals and yeah. heroin and opioids and stuff like that, uh, which it seems like a, just a crazy amount of money. Oh, yeah. I mean, not sustainable. But how much I mean, but if you think you're going to the bars quite a bit, I mean, it's not unheard of to drop four or five hundred dollars in an evening at a bar. Sure. And I think for me, it was more that I would drink on such a daily basis that I would drink to blackout drunk and then it would affect my ability to get up and go to work in the morning. So I'm missing work all the time and my paycheck takes a huge hit and then I can't pay my rent. Mm -hmm. I can't pay my bills. Bills start to fall behind and then, you know, it becomes this never ending cycle of now I'm depressed because I'm losing my place or I can't pay my bills. And my only escape for that is my drug of choice. So, you know, it just keeps going. And now you say it's gotten so bad that your health is starting to decline. Yeah, health has started to decline. I've I've gained a ton of weight. I've gained since I met my wife. I have ga- I have gained you know about two hundred twenty five pounds. I was over four hundred pounds heavy. Get out. And uh, yeah, is that for real? No, that's that's absolutely wow. for real. Because looking at you right now, I can't even imagine. Right, and uh, I started having all sorts of health problems: high blood pressure. Um, I was having oxygen troubles. I had to wear oxygen at night. Sometimes I had to walk around with an oxygen tank because I'd get dizzy from like not getting enough oxygen levels. Um, I had really bad knees and feet issues constantly to where it made it difficult for me to walk, um, let alone, you know, get any meaningful exercise. Um, and it just kept getting worse. And I remember how much do you think you were drinking? I think towards the end I was drinking about half gallon of whiskey a day. So that was pretty, uh, you know, I remember specifically not going to work and sitting around waiting for the liquor store to open at 11 and going into the liquor store, buying a half gallon, go home and drink probably about half of it till I passed out and then wake up again sometime in the evening, five or 6 PM and drink the rest of it and then start the whole process over again the next day. So, and this, you're still married. Yep. But she's not impressed. No, no, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely not. And it's, you know, it it started to slowly deteriorate all of my moral compass and all of my morals as well. You know, it starts to, you say that, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking a lot, but I, I would never do this. I would never be that guy. I would never, you know, I would never not pay my bills until you do. I would never not steal until you do. You know, I wouldn't lie to certain people until you do. And that, that was, you know, my pattern. And then, you know, eventually it finally came to a head. And um, when I was 35, it was, uh, <laughs> this is, sorry, this is a little bit hard for me to talk about, but it finally came to a head in a blackout drunk. I struck my wife and, uh, you know, didn't, didn't remember doing it, but I woke up the next morning and uh, she was, you know, upset and packing her things and saying she was going to leave me and uh, she had a mark on her face and I knew she didn't even have to tell me I knew that I had done that and it was just completely against everything that I believed in Um, took me to 
probably the darkest place I ever felt like I had been in up to that point. My kids weren't around me very much, and and it wasn't because their mom was keeping them from me. It's because they didn't want to be around me. You know what I mean? They didn't want to be around their drunk dad anymore, and so they were spending all their time with their mom. And um, you know, I just virtually didn't have a very good relationship with them at that point. Um, and I, you know, sank pretty low. I I contemplated suicide. You know, I thought about ending it, um, especially when I decided, oh, well, I'm going to try and quit, and I couldn't. I remember I couldn't physically quit. I, I would stop drinking, and I would get really sick. I would get, uh, you know, extremely anxious, um, not able to concentrate, not able to sleep, all of those things that come from alcohol withdrawal. And, uh, you know, I remember that's when I realized I was beat is because I was just like, I can't. I, I really, here I am, I really want to actually quit. You know, no one's telling me I need to. I'm just wanting to do it, and I can't do it. And uh, I broke down at work one day. One of the few days I actually went, my boss was like, why are you not coming in? You know what I mean? Why are you missing so much work? Is there something going on? And she just caught me at that low moment, and I broke down. and was just like, I'm an alcoholic. I was like, I know that I tell you I'm sick, but I'm not. I'm, I'm drunk sick. I'm an alcoholic. I can't quit drinking. I really need help. I don't know what to do about it anymore. And luckily, she just happened to be in recovery herself and, uh, you know, gave me the number to uh, Action Recovery, you know, hooked me up with them and told me to reach out to them and ask for help. And I did that. And within a couple of days, I was in treatment. So, wow, that's powerful when you open up and share. You never know, you know, who's listening. And that's that's wonderful that your boss was in recovery herself and, you know, of course, willing to support you. Yeah. So in a couple of days, uh, you check yourself into treatment. Mm-hmm. Your wife's still probably not too happy with you. Well, and, and that was, you know, part of it of, you know, if you don't do something, I'm, you know, definitely leaving because I can't, I can't stay around while you do this and I'm not going to allow you to physically harm me. And so, you know, and, and rightfully so. So she had every, every reason to leave. So... So you felt morally, emotionally bankrupt. Yes, absolutely. Felt like I was, you know, a shell of what I should be, of the person that I felt like I should be. So So you check in there and uh, Action Recovery, we've had a lot of people on from their program who are doing wonderful things in the uh, recovery world. What resonated with you in there? I think... The biggest thing that stood out to me pretty quickly was talking about how my addiction isn't a disease of the substance. And I've heard you guys mention that a little bit. It's a thinking. It's thinking, you know, the the substances. That's why, you know, switching from one substance to another substance didn't work for me um, because it has nothing to do with the actual substance. It has to do with how I think. And when I started to kind of get that understanding and, you know, have counselors and fellow group members kind of talking to me about that and how my thinking was wrong. You know what I mean? That's, that's when it finally started to click and be like, this is why I've never been able to quit. This is why I've never been able to deal with anything. Let me ask you this in your journeys, your travels uh, of the many years of partying, did you ever run into somebody who was like you that had a problem like you, or did you feel like you were the only one? I felt, I felt like I was different when I was younger you know what I mean? When I was in high school and I had friends telling me that I shouldn't drink, you know what I mean? I felt like I was different than everybody else that way. But again, I, I kind of chalked it up as I just haven't figured it out yet. They've obviously already figured it out. I haven't figured it out. I need to figure it out. And as I got older and I saw people that had problems with it, I think I just always found something about that person that was different as a way of self-justifying why I'm not that bad. You know, To me, in my head, an alcoholic was someone who's sitting homeless on a street corner with a paper bag that they're drinking out of. And I've got so, a job, a house, and yeah, a wife. So it's like, I couldn't be an alcoholic. I couldn't be, I'm not that guy. So, you know, clearly there's a difference there, but. You know, um, there's not, right? Right, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. He knows now. <laughs> just, just making sure, because I had the same thoughts. Right. I mean, I did, I was like, I'm not like you guys. And but I couldn't I think be more people wrong. like the two of you who share your stories break down that stereotype. Because I think we all had that stereotype, or at least I did growing up. If you would have asked me as a teenager to draw a picture of an alcoholic, that's probably what I would have drawn as a homeless person with a paper bag. But Five o'clock shadow, five, yeah, sitting next to a fire, no job, close to a train. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
fingerless gloves yeah. for yeah. some reason because you'd think you'd want the fingers, uh, yeah, but they know. always are fingerless. I don't, I don't know. know why. But um, but but the truth is we have to break that stereotype down so that people understand that you know alcohol is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter who you are, how educated you are, how much money you have or make, uh, what your status in life is. It, it can get anybody anywhere. Yeah, I think that's the, the big, big misconception. Conception is that you know alcohol. You know the disease of alcoholism is just looking for poor people that they're just going to attack. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. Or people who don't have a lot of things. Like I'm. Let's get that guy. Yeah. Let's get that guy. Oh, not that guy. He's got a Harvard education. He no. Right. We're, we're not going to go by him. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't care. No, it doesn't. It, it absolutely does not. Or the misconception that it's you know someone that has weak is weak minded or has low morals or you know exactly. I mean? all of those misconceptions about right you know, only affecting those types of people and it's it's just not true. I uh, had an interesting conversation recently with a friend about another friend, and I said to him, I already knew what I thought, but I said, "Do you think he's an alcoholic?" And my friend, who I've known most of my life, said, "No, I don't think he drinks every day." He just drinks on the weekends and then it gets out of hand. And I said, well, you know, that's an alcoholic. And he's like, well, he doesn't drink every day. So here's my educated friend who we've known each other our whole lives. And he was still kind of holding on to a stereotype that I once had, which was like, oh, an alcoholic is somebody with low morals, without a job, who drinks every day, and that's all they do. In fact, this friend of ours, I believe, is struggling with alcoholism, Mm -hmm. doesn't drink all the time. I don't know if it's even every weekend, but when this person drinks, whoo, watch out. Like it gets uh, out of hand pretty fast. And so there, we need to help people understand like alcoholism looks very different from person to person, but it's still alcoholism. Absolutely. So while you're in treatment at Action Recovery, uh, how long do you spend there? I was actually there for six months. Um, You know, it was supposed to be a 90 day program. Apparently, I needed a lot more help than that, but uh, it took me six months to, uh, you know, complete their program. And I, man, what was, I, what, why did it take so long for you? I think for me that, you know, that initial feeling of like finding like I'm finally figuring this out. I think I was scared a little bit to leave. Um, I think you like the comfort, yeah, because I, you know what's going on right. in there. You and, feel safe, and I felt like it was working. You know what I mean? For the first time in my life, I felt like I was actually changing instead of just not drinking. Because to me, that's all I had ever done before is I just didn't drink. That's and, interesting because so, he's the first person to ever say that on this podcast. Yeah, he goes, "I was changing. I wasn't just not I like drinking." That. Yeah. Because a lot of people think, "Well, if I just quit drinking." then the problems will go away. But as we've learned with you, Russ, it, it, it's the thinking. You know what I mean? It's, it, you know, I remember sitting in rehab and my therapist goes, drinking's not your problem. I go, then why am I in rehab? Right. Goes, well, your problems <laughs> right. are your problems and drinking's been your solution. It's a problem now. But yeah. you know, we've got to go back and unpack some baggage. We've got to do some thinking changing. Right, absolutely. And so six months. And Dr. Matt started the podcast with wondering uh, what – people and addicts do that are in recovery to maintain their sobriety? Are you doing things currently that are maintaining your sobriety? Are you constantly working on it or what does it look like? Yeah, I, I, I think of it like a, a, a disease that I have to constantly maintain. I have to do things or it will, you know, eventually come back. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I believe in prayer and meditation and, um, you know, I, th- I think, constant connection with other people that are struggling with it or that have been through that struggle is very paramount. Um, you know, going to AA meetings is something that I do pretty regularly. Um, and then I also was able to eventually talk Lizzie into letting me help out at Action Recovery and just uh, be a peer support person there. And so, you know, that gave me that weekly dose of, uh, you know, meeting with other people who are still struggling. And that, that to me has been the best medicine of all. It's just, you know, helping other people that are struggling with it. I mean, to me, I, I think, you know, all the other stuff helps, but that's, that's, that's my insulin. That's the secret yeah, sauce. That's my insulin is being able to help other people. Now on the podcast, you said you got up over 400 pounds. Yeah. And for me, uh, working out is crucial to my recovery. Absolutely. Uh, do you find that for you as well? I find that now, you know, when I was early in recovery with uh, the the issues I was having with my health, it just wasn't a priority. It was more like let's just let's just work on one thing at a time. Let's get the the drinking thing under control, and then we'll focus on that later on. And it did become something that 
um, you know, I desired, hey, life is getting pretty good, you know, now that you're figuring out this sobriety thing, maybe you want to stick around a little while longer and and, uh, not die before you're 40, you know? So it's like, okay, well, how do we get this weight thing figured out? And I struggled. I struggled losing weight and uh, couldn't exercise. Because that's an addiction in itself. Right. Couldn't exercise um, because it was just too painful. It was too, you know, I could barely walk. So, um, you know, finally I had someone suggest to me, uh, you know, getting a, a stomach surgery or a, a gastric bypass. The lap band. Right. And and I was like, well, you know, that seems like a solution, but, you know, I want to uh, look into it more. And, you know, I had to quit smoking. I had to go on a diet for a while. I had to do some things to uh, try and jump through all the hoops to make that possible. And then I had to save up the money for it as well. But, uh, you know, being sober made that possible. And I was finally able to get that done about a year and a half into my recovery, I was able to get that surgery and that helped me lose, you know, a significant enough amount of weight that I was able to start moving again and start getting up. And then I was so grateful that I could get up and move that it became something I loved and, you know, eventually not only walk, but run and, and running is something I've, I've just kind of become an obsession of mine lately. So how how much do you weigh now? Just 200. 200. So yeah. you've lost over 200 pounds. Yeah. Wow, that is incredible. All while, while battling. Addiction. Also, yeah, while in trying to be in recovery. Yeah. 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 That's impressive. Do you feel like those have gone hand in hand, like getting healthy, losing weight has helped you also want to stay away from alcohol? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I know that uh, I just like myself a lot more now. I think that that's been paramount in my recovery is finding some self-love. Um, you know, not feeling like I have to fit into anything and not feeling like I have to, uh, you know, have certain things coming to a place of gratitude. Um, you know, I, and I just like myself a lot better now. And it's, you know, it's easy for me when I think about drinking, when those thoughts creep back in, mm-hmm. you know, the romantic thoughts that you have about the great, the old days or whatever, then you, it's easy for me to play the tape and go, hey, this is, you know, this is what always happens to you. It's always going to happen, and I have to re-accept that and, uh, you know, keep keep working on it. So, it wasn't easy for you to tell us, and it's hard for me to ask. So how is you and your wife now? Because, I mean, that's a, a pretty big deal. I mean, that's it's huge. Yeah. better. I, I think we're better than ever. Um, you know, she's struggled with recovery a little bit herself, and she got help uh, a little over a year ago for her addiction issues. And, you know, it's amazing to me that we've been able to work through those issues together. Um, Because, you know, I think, quite honestly, it would tear a lot of people apart. Mm -hmm. Um, We've both been really lucky to have good support systems. You know, her family, my family um, have all been very supportive with our journey and, you know, helping us uh, work through all of those issues by just being there, helping us with the kids when we need to go do recovery things. Um, So it's, it's been huge. One more question for you. Uh, your 410 pound self is looking <laughs> in the mirror and it looks back and sees you now. Would you believe it? No, absolutely not. It's it, to me that was, I just wanted to quit drinking. And so it's like, I couldn't even imagine how good things could really be, you know, four and a half years later that it would just be as good as it has been. So I've been truly blessed. The amazing thing, Dr. I've heard somebody else say that too. It is, it is. The amazing thing is the journey that Russ has gone on in four and a half years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, and you want to talk about evolving and progressing and changing. I love it when somebody says nobody ever changes. Bull crap. Yeah. We'll listen to five episodes of our podcast. We'll show you people who've overcome amazing things who have changed for the better. Or all 300 plus episodes. Yeah. Either way. Well, I did. Yeah. yeah. I didn't want to overcommit them. <laughs> uh, so what does life look like for you now? Well, let me let me make a quick okay. comment on that just yeah. real quick. And that is, so it is not uncommon for somebody to ask me, like I'm a psychologist and not all psychologists do therapy and it's not the only thing I do, but I do a lot of it during the week. And I enjoy it. Love being a therapist. Um, But people will often ask me, like, oh, how can you do that? Like all those hours a week talking to people about their problems. You know, doesn't it just get you down and depressed? And, you know, people come in and they talk about everything. And sure, I mean, a lot of the things they talk about are, are sad and stressful to them. But 
what I appreciate is what's happening on the show right now. It also happens in therapy sessions where you're like, you get to see people change and you get to see the hope come back into their, their eyes and in, into their life. And, you know, I, I love being a psychologist for that reason. I love doing this show able to be for a that part reason. Of it. Yeah. Is, is here's Russ, you know, he's trim, he's fit. He's got a sparkle in his eye. He, he's got a great relationship with his wife. But if you go back to that, you know, moment where you woke up and your wife said she was leaving. Like you, if we only saw that snapshot of Russ, we might all think, well, it's too late to change, but you and I know better. I know better as a psychologist, you know, better that, and, and Russ knows better now that no matter how low your low is, there's a way to turn it around and you can go from, you know, zero to hero in your own life, but it, it takes hard work. It takes a lot of support and nobody changes on their own. But I, that's what I love about being a psychologist is not that I hear problems all the time. I don't mind that. What I love is those problems often morph into positive change and seeing a Phoenix born out of the ashes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, one last question. Um, how's your relationship with your sons? It's it's great. I mean, the difference is night and day. You know, they obviously came back into my life. My my oldest, especially, he's uh, going to graduate from high school this year, and I'm excited awesome. for that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've joked around with him a few times over the last couple of years. Like, you know, what would you think if I started drinking again, just to see his reaction? And he's absolutely like, you wouldn't see me anymore. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. hang out with you. So, I mean, that's how open you know, are you with your boys about? Uh, alcohol, drugs, talking about those. I'm pretty open with him. I mean, he knows, he knows that I, I went and got help and he, you know, came to some of the family groups that we had there. And, uh, he knows that when I go and I leave for, when I go to action recovery still to help out, he knows where I'm going and what I'm doing. Cause he's asked me, you know, what do you do up there? And, you know, I say, I help people like me. I'm trying to help people, you know, find, find that sobriety and find that, you know? And so I think he thinks that's pretty cool, but. Well, I think that's great because that's also part of that intergenerational change, right? Is being in, and your mom tried to talk to you about it. And, you know, I think that for someone of her generation, that was good effort, right? Right. But I think we have to keep it going and have an, those sorts of conversations should never be taboo in our homes. I think talking about drugs and alcohol and substance abuse, um, and if it runs in our family, if we don't know if it runs in our family, whatever, we should talk about those things. Communication is key. Yep. Hey, Russ, thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your story today. Uh, I related so many times when you were telling it, and uh, I'm proud of you to see all the things you've overcome, uh, to see you rise from the ashes. I mean, you're beautiful, man. You're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Matt? Same. I'm just super impressed. First of all, I think I say this a lot, but I, I really am grateful for people that'll come on and tell their story, even the hard parts like you did today, because I think it's that level of honesty that really cuts through all the nonsense and people relate to that. Um, we have listeners to the show who comment on our Facebook and other places all the time about how helpful it is for people like you to come on and share your story and inspire them for another week you know, in either their own recovery or helping other people in their family. It's really awesome. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, man, I couldn't be more impressed with from where you went. You painted this picture that's pretty dire, like physically and, and, and spiritually, emotionally to where you are now. It's just really impressive. Thank you. And thank you for stopping by and listening to another episode of Project Recovery. And in case you forgot, Project Recovery is what? It's a KSL podcast, see money. He's a rock star. He is. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. 
KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.